Hello and welcome to the Work Joy Jam podcast. I'm your host, Beth Stallwood. In today's episode, I am joined by Lauren Neal. And Lauren has a history of working in the engineering sector, a sector that is often dominated with men. And we talk today about her experiences being a woman in that world and some things that have been great for her, some things that she's found challenging and how she has turned that from what uh, someone said to her once was really great fodder for a book into not just a book valued at work, but into an approach around how we can help people, how we can help organisations be more inclusive and how we can think about doing our jobs as leaders and managers and colleagues and friends and teammates really well well rather than some of the things that maybe don't happen so well in industry and in our workplaces. I really hope you enjoy this conversation. Welcome to the Work Joy Jam. I am really pleased today to be joined by the wonderful Lauren Neal. But rather than me introduce Lauren, why don't you tell us a little bit about who you are, what you do, and maybe a bit about how you came to do what you do. So, hi Beth, I'm really happy to be here. So, my name is Lauren Neal, as Beth said. Uh, I have worked in the energy sector for 18 years um, as an engineer turned project manager. Uh, I am a chartered engineer, chartered project professional, and most recently, as of last year, a uh, published author. My, while I say my day job, I am an engineer turned project manager. I am really passionate about helping women in STEM, um, particularly avoid some of the, I'm going to say more negative experiences I've had in my career. But also, I know that it's not just women in STEM that can be impacted being minorities and being the only voices in the room. So I'm really passionate about making sure that everybody feels uh, valued at work and feeling like they are valued for their views, their thoughts, their skills, their experiences. Um, And I'm just very much against ticking boxes for the purposes of demographics. (laughs) Amazing. Lovely introduction. And I feel like the image I have of you is wearing many different hats. So engineer, project manager, author. Um, It'd be lovely to find out a little bit more about that. So tell us a little bit about how did you originally get into the engineering world? Well, the funny story that I always share is when I was six years old, my dad bought me this Lego Technic JCB for my birthday. And it was meant to be age nine to 11 or something. And he helped me build it. And I remember him saying to me, you're my little engineer. Mm -hmm. And I never thought anything of it. Um, Then at school, I remember this girl saying to me, what do you want to be when you grow up? And I said, my dad says I'm going to be an engineer. And she said, you can't be an engineer. That's a man's job. True story. (laughs) So it was, you know, it wasn't something that I thought too much of as I as I was growing up. But I was really enjoyed maths and computing at school, and it was my tech studies teacher when I was applying to uni asked me what, what I was applying to. I was kind of going more down the software computing route, and he said to me, "Do you want to go into an industry that is changing so much?" Because this was two thousand and two. Um, he said, "Versus the principles of engineering will never change." And he said, and you're quite good at it. <laughs> so I, <laughs> Always helps. So I thought, well, I'll split the difference. And I did electronic and electrical specializing in computer engineering. And I was one of very few women on the course. But like, I'll, I'll be specific. When I graduated, there were 12 of us in the class who got a master's and only two were female. Now, I didn't think that was weird. I just thought, yeah. I just happened to be into engineering and other people are into art or other things that I am not. I I didn't see it as a thing. (laughs) Then when I started in the workplace, again, it just wasn't something that hit me between the eyes that it, it was an issue for me. But I ended up I worked for five different companies in the first six years where um, when I first started staff is all of them. And each time I was trying to find somewhere that fit 
because especially the first two jobs, I thought I was going to do one thing. And then I ended up doing things like being on the IT help desk, setting up usernames and passwords. And the second one in particular, when I raised this to them, they said to me, that was all I could do with my master's in electronic electrical engineering. And if I wanted to do something else, I'd have to go back to uni and do chemical engineering. So I, that one, I did experience some pretty poor behaviors where I was working for a guy who openly said women belong in the home and in the kitchen. And when I spoke up about the poor behaviors I was experiencing, they terminated my contract. Wow. And it was 2009. And I even spoke to a lawyer about it. And they said I would have a great case for constructive dismissal, but the law didn't protect me because I hadn't been there long enough. Mm. So I then literally put my CV everywhere, went to a different company, and they trained me to be a subsea engineer. And it was great. I had a great job, a great boss. He was much, much older. He was in his mid-60s. And I remember he just came over to my desk and put this procedure on my table and said to me, Lauren, you need to go to site, go and witness this test. We don't have an inspector. On you go. And that's what I did. And um, I spent about six months going back and forth to this site, witnessing all these different uh, tests of this power cable. And then sometimes they even let me do it because I was there so often that they knew me. And then I went offshore with it and installed it and it just kind of went from there. So, you know, I did change companies after that, but it was for different reasons then. It was like mm. growth and so on. But yeah, I I know we'll come back to it, but I, I'm always wanting to be balanced about it. Yes, I've had some negative behaviors, but that guy's name was Joe, who just trusted this person who was new and young and different and he just said on you go go to site <laughs> wow it's like a, it's, a, it's a really interesting story in many different ways I've got so many questions for you so I'll pick a few out that we can go through isn't it interesting that even at a young age when you're interested in something someone says that job isn't for you that's for boys I know it's six years old as well <laughs> at six years old somebody can have a an opinion about a gender defined role <laughs> and they do say by eight years old you know in, in primary school kids do have gender specific roles in their mind already so it's not it's not totally unprecedented it's actually quite well researched but it's quite a stark thing isn't it to think about you cannot be that I know and that's the thing at that point I just kind of felt like oh why is she saying that to me yeah. I, I didn't you know because you're not you just kind of feel like a little bit hurt I suppose at that point because I didn't understand anything more than I had just sat and built this thing with my dad that's what he said and I was like yes that's what my dad says <laughs> yeah <laughs> my dad says like but also like how um clever your dad was knowing that at six years old that's what you were gonna end up being it's really funny because especially all those years later when I went into sub C because he used to be a diver in the North Sea Wow. Um, which is how I ended up being born and grew up in Aberdeen because um, he's originally from London. And um, yeah, it's a funny thing because then I was like, is that nature or nurture <laughs> all these years later? <laughs> yeah, something in the DNA maybe there about back to the sea being called there in some particular <laughs> way. Um, so I'm fascinated by that. And then isn't it interesting that you didn't think it was unusual that you were one of the only females in your class, but then you experience what is a terrible experience in your first few jobs around people. I mean, I I believe that some people still think that about women. I do believe it because I know it's true. Very few people see, say those things out loud anymore. <laughs> I know. I mean, I, so that, that happened in 2009. If I think about it from then until now, I've heard, it's kind of all the extremes. Oh, you only got the job because you're a woman or um, oh, don't worry about redundancy because, you, or you know, even just a few years ago, I was told um, you take the, uh, you take the diversity box. And that was said out loud. And that was only two years ago, which is crazy to me that we are mm. still there. Now, up until probably 2020 and I, I feel embarrassed to admit that 
but I was one of these people that, and I'll say one of these women that thought, okay, maybe the reason I'm not progressing is because maybe I don't, I'm not articulate enough. Maybe I don't, I'm not succinct enough. Maybe I'm not this, maybe I'm not that. And I spoke to a friend of mine who's probably about, I don't know, six, seven years older than me. And she said to me, Lauren, you sound just like me. And, but that wasn't enough to put this light bulb on in my head. It was when I spoke to another friend of mine, I was having a bit of a vent because I was having a bad day. <laughs> and um, I just said, I just feel like it makes no difference if I go to work or not. And she said to me, and she is now, she's probably in her late twenties. So she was a little bit earlier than that. And she said, Lauren, I know we're very different levels, but I feel exactly the same. And I went, no, because when you are in your early to mid twenties, you should be it. You're an absolute sponge for experiences and learning and opportunities and all of that. And I was so mad that she was feeling completely redundant because her ideas weren't being listened to and the work that she was doing, anybody could have done. And she just didn't feel like she was offering anything unique. And, and this lady, she is brilliant. You know, you can spot these superstars. And that suddenly just put this light bulb in my head that I went, hang on a second. It's not me. <laughs> this is happening to a lot of people. Yeah. And, and as soon as I saw that and I started asking the questions, particularly when I was doing the research for my book, I started seeing the same scars everywhere. Yeah. And tell us a little bit about how you go from being before we get to the book but how do you go from being an a subsea engineer which I don't even really know what one of those is so maybe you need to explain to me what one of those people is I'm imagining you in some kind of diving kit um underwater fixing things and I feel like that is probably wrong so tell me what that is and how you go from that to being a project manager and then how you go from project manager to also writing a book <laughs> So when I when I was a subsea engineer, my my thing, at least where I started was so the very first job I did where I was going to inspect a power cable. Um, and then I went offshore with it. I then I say graduated from power cables, which had um, electrical cables and fiber optics into it in it to umbilicals, which are basically power, the same type of power cable, but had tubes, steel tubes in it. And what the umbilical does is connect from a, a platform offshore to the equipment subsea. And it opens and closes valves. It can also read pressures, temperatures, and it basically sends that information up to the top sides for people to view and, and so on. So my job was managing the suppliers that, that make these pieces of equipment. Right. So I would... I think that's where I kind of went from engineer to project manager because when I started off, I was reviewing all of the documents, um, reviewing the testing and so on, making sure that they all the tests were as expected. And then I went into more of performance management, so cost, schedule. Um, and I, as you can tell, I'm a talker. I'm a people person. So I just would build these really good relationships with the suppliers because I'd spend a lot of time with them. Yeah. Uh, so that was then when I made that change. Also because I changed companies and they were very clear on, are you an engineer or are you a project manager? And <laughs> every time someone makes you make that decision or saying you're either this or that, I go, why? Why can't you yeah. be both? <laughs> So I went the project management route um, and yeah, I mean, I, I still enjoy it because I like spending time with the suppliers, getting to know them. Um, you ask any of my previous suppliers, they'll all be like, yeah, Lauren's quite hard on you, but <laughs> <laughs> I'd like to say I'm, I'll I'm a lot more refined than I used to be. I remember sitting in front of them uh, years. It must have been over 10 years ago now. And they gave me this schedule. And I just went, should I just throw this in the bin? Because you miss it every single time. And they just looked at me and went, thank you for the feedback. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Thanks for being a demanding customer. 
<laughs> now I'm thinking, I wouldn't say that these days. I think that, that was a bit, I was a bit rough around the edges then. <laughs> you were in your learning zone, you were facing into who you are today. I think it's, um, you know, a couple of things to pick up on that before we go into how you get from there to authoring your wonderful book. Um, is thinking about this, and how the world of work is quite often you have to be this or that it's quite you have to fit into a nice neat box and if you don't fit into that nice neat box we don't quite know what to do with you so when you didn't fit on the it help desk into the nice neat box of just resetting everyone's passwords and being thankful etc and you wanted more from that people are like no you have to go and be a chemical engineer and retrain but then you go somewhere which maybe you do fit better and they go oh, well, we'll train you to do the subsea engineering job. We're going to train you how to do that. And then you can go and do this. And then we're going to give you a bigger bit of that. And then suddenly you're in the world of project management. And it's happened almost organically. And you probably never set out and said, I'm going to be a project manager in this world. But, you know, the opportunities that you were offered and given when people didn't put you in a single box um, have allowed you to get somewhere in a different way. Absolutely. And for... You know, I don't think it's ever been described how you've put it there, but it, it's been exactly that. And I think for me, when I look back on my career, that it's been those times where people have let me find my space and, like you say, grow organically, that I feel it, it's always worked really well. Uh, I I mean, after I had done umbilicals, by, by the time I came out of that, it was five years and there was again it was I was at a different company by then it was a different guy and he said to me you need to be stretched mm -hmm. and said to he put me on this project and it actually ended up taking me out to Azerbaijan for five years and I remember sitting with him and it's rather than just umbilicals suddenly all the subsea equipment was going to come to me after it was built come to me in country and it was my job to work with three suppliers to make sure that they had their site receipt tests done so they hadn't been damaged in transit, all the mobilization checks ready for installation offshore, and then um, provide the vendor personnel to go offshore to help with installation, commissioning, and so on. And I didn't have a clue about half of this stuff. And he sat down with me and we had a whiteboard and he wrote down, these are all your stakeholders, go figure it out. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and it, it, it does sometimes take somebody to give you that opportunity and to push you a little bit and to see that you have more potential, but you don't know which direction to put that in. And that's a great, so you've had like the terrible experiences and that's a really great experience. And I always think at certain points in our career, we have to be a beginner again. And that sounds, when you've kind of got an expertise, you're like, oh, being a beginner and not knowing what I'm doing doesn't feel great at this point. Ah, but if you ever want to grow anymore, you have to be accepting of being a beginner again. Absolutely. I, I think I have felt or I've had the most rewarding roles when it really was sink or swim and it was just chucked out, go figure it out. Uh, I mean, the first times I went offshore, it was very much figure it out <laughs> um, scenarios. Uh, going to another country where I didn't even speak the language that's a figure it out scenario <laughs> yeah and I, I'm just sitting here wondering like whether an engineer is the best person to give a figure it out scenario to it's like right let's work out the steps involved let's work out what works here it's a funny one I did this um psychometric assessment a couple of years ago and one of them said that in the in the scale of comfort and uncertainty I'm very high in being comfortable in the uncertainty. And I think that is what helps me throughout all of this. Yeah. Well, yeah, because like going offshore, I imagine I imagine one of those like offshore rigs is not like the most hospitable place um, on earth. No, I mean the first the first offshore trip I had, it this one was actually quite nice. It was uh it was a it was on a boat. And the guy who was on days, um, it's a really weird convoluted story because his dad worked with my dad and we worked that out while we were offshore. Oh, wow. <laughs> um, and um, he was on days, I was nights. Uh, and it, my it, trip was only supposed to be maybe a week or two. Um, it ended up being six weeks in total because it really was a what could go wrong, did go wrong job. And the first time this guy's name was Patrice, took me out on the back deck 
he said to me, you're probably going to fall over at some point. Just try not to break any bones. And he said it very straight to me. And then he said, okay, first thing, look at what the crane's doing. And then he went through the induction of what to check out, what to look out for when you're on the back deck. And a few days later, he says to me, so when's the last time you went out? And I went, I haven't. And he said, why? And I said, because I don't want to fall. <laughs> <laughs> and he just started to laugh and he went, oh, that backfired. He said he's he because he'd worked offshore for so long, he'd met so many young people who thought they were invincible and they go off and they're just completely oblivious to the risks there. And he said, but but you knew it was dangerous. And he went, come on. And then he went with me offshore <laughs> because by then we were sailing. So it was a little more wobbly. And he was like, are you OK? <laughs> you see people along the way to help support and guide. <laughs> Yes. So tell me a little bit about the story from doing your day job to thinking about writing your book and how did that come about? So I guess it it starts in Azerbaijan. Um, So I went out to Azerbaijan in 2015 and a colleague of mine said to me, do something for the women when you go out there. And I didn't and, you know, it, she said it to me, it landed in my brain, but it didn't, you know, I didn't really think too much of it. Then when I went out there, you know, I probably had the first year of just figuring things out. And then I had some experiences because we were changing scope from one team to another. And it was a big group of guys who one of them once on an email that went internal and external, I asked a question on it and he replied, Lauren, I'm removing you from this because you're not technical. And I was livid (laughs) because (laughs) my role at that point, I was a project manager. I wasn't an engineer, even though I'm a chartered engineer. I I don't forget that, (laughs) but they just deemed me not technical. And I had this pretty bad experience with this team where they were sending reply to all emails about me, which weren't very nice. Um, and it all came to a thing when an email was surfaced, got reported, and then the company took action as they should. But when things like that would happen, I would go home and I'd talk to my partner and he would say to me, don't worry, it's all good book material. <laughs> and it was How just right this, could he be? It was this throwaway comment that we used to say that oh, this will make a good book one day. Because it was these, it, I, I just seemed to be a magnet for this stuff. Um, there were some, you know, big situations that happened and smaller situations. And yet, it, like, I couldn't go a year without something. So I became very accustomed to HR investigations and how they all work and all of this. And, and I can smile about it and say, look, I live to tell the tale. Sometimes speaking up is a good thing. Um, yeah. Of course, I experienced in 2009 where it wasn't. So I've, I've definitely seen both sides. And so then I started getting involved in the women's network um, for the company um, I was working for there. And I started noticing that, I mean, culturally, it's very different in Azerbaijan, that it's very hierarchical. Um, women sometimes aren't comfortable speaking out in front of men, but also then when you put in the expat layer in there and you get international people, there's that added um, cultural difference. Mm. And what I started realizing was there were certain things I had just picked up in the UK about how you present yourself at work, how you make yourself visible in the right way, not the, hey, look at me, it's the how you speak about the work, but you're inadvertently showing what you can do at the same time without being too direct about it. And I started working with these women on how to like clean up their internal CVs. How do you make your summary? Some of them were like three pages long. And I was like, no, it's a paragraph that you put at the top. Who are you? What do you do? What are you passionate about? You know, it needs to just hit people between the eyes. And so I got really interested in that. And again, listening to their stories, like I say, it wasn't until later that I got that light bulb moment. But at that point, it was just, oh, I've got some knowledge and experience I can share. Yeah. So 
fast forward to 2020, where are we now? 24, so it was 22. And I was back in the UK and my partner just says to me one day, are you ever going to write this book? (laughs) And I just went, I'll show you. (laughs) And I had been on this course. It was one where I did that psychometric profile. And I met um, Catherine Bishop. And she said to me, she knows somebody who can help authors and connected me with Alison Jones. And Alison was running her um, boot camp. It wasn't the boot camp yet. It was her challenge. So, um, yeah, the two-week book proposal challenge. And so I joined it and I quite enjoyed it. Then I joined the boot camp. And then by the time I would put the contents page together, that was when I put a post on LinkedIn asking for women in STEM or people who know women in STEM to come and share their stories with me. And the response was incredible. Uh, And like I said, I'm listening to these women and each time I'm thinking, it's the same. It it didn't matter that they were in banking or in software or in cybersecurity or it was all the same. (laughs) It was about, you know, saying something in a meeting room and being ignored completely. And then they just continued talking. Or sometimes, like I say, someone said, oh, it doesn't matter if you get made redundant, you're, you've you got a husband, they'll look after you. And and these are things all being said in the last five years. Yeah, yeah. So th- I just really lit a fire under me. And it, my working with Alison really sort of shaped my thinking, because originally I said, I want to do something for women in STEM. But then the more we talk about it, I said, but it's not the women in STEM that are broken it's the workplace cultures Mm. and like I said me having spent time internationally I saw what I saw some really quiet non-western men also feeling like they weren't being included or they were suddenly being given deputy roles instead of the actual role and I'd never seen any western person have to do that (laughs) so I'm like well why why do they get the manager job and that person gets a deputy manager hmm and, and once you see it, you can't unsee it. So it's now I'm just, <laughs> now I'm just quite opinionated. And I point it out when I see it. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I think this is such a good point And one that I, I would really, really support in many different ways is this idea that we need to do all the work with women because they need to be different or, you know, we need to change how women are. So they act more in line with how a man would do it. It's just so old fashioned, but actually thinking about how do we change workplace cultures to help people feel valued, to make sure people are included, to take down some of those systemic issues that's a really important piece of work and I think that's where your book comes at it from doesn't it it's thinking about how do we make organizations understand this stuff better and do it better absolutely I've had some friends of mine um when they've read my book so the women who have read my book the general view is either you get it because suddenly they're feeling very validated seeing their stories and a couple of times people have said well yeah, but I didn't learn anything from it. And I'm thinking, because the book's actually intended for men to read it. So I love it if women read it, absolutely. Um, even better if they pass it on to a male colleague. Yeah. Because I have met so many men who are really, you know, they're very good people, and they just have no idea this stuff is going on. Yeah. And... I mean, even I spoke to this this guy last year and he said to me, Lauren, am I just sheltered that, that I've never heard any of this stuff? And I just said to him, I said, but why would you? It's it's not just going to come to you. You need to, you need to ask people, you know, like, like even me and myself all these years ago, I thought the problem was me. And it wasn't until I started talking to people and asking people and being vulnerable myself and sharing, look, this has happened to me. And then someone will say, me too. So that's, that's what I, I say to all these guys. It's like, well, how do you know? <laughs> yeah. So it's not, it, it is a, 
it has to be an active pursuit of changing what's going on. It can't be a, I'm just waiting for it all to come to me with all the answers. People need to do something. Absolutely. And and the thing is, if someone is not feeling valued, they're not going to go and advertise it, because especially if they think the problem's them. Yeah. Because it's like, hey, I think I suck at my job. No one's going to say that. <laughs> no, because we're all going to be in survival mode going, don't tell them that you think you suck at your job, because then everyone else will definitely think you suck at your job, and then you won't have a job anymore. Exactly. And the thing is, pe- I'm absolutely sure there will be people that will think that they're not very good at various aspects and they'll just be I I don't know about anyone else but I just feel like you end up going internal and saying okay and you become in that fight or flight mode so what do I need to do next what do I need to do next how do I get this person off my back and you get so focused on the here and now that you don't see the big picture then Yeah. And then the challenge comes to you, oh, well, you're not strategic enough or you're not, you know, it's like, ah! Yes. And there's always going to be someone saying, oh, what about this? What about that? What about that? And it's trying to to shift that whole that whole piece in there. Yeah. So, you know, when I, when I coach women on this, I keep going back to what do you want? Like, do you want to be the CEO? Do you want do you want to be a project manager do you want to be an engineer do you want to work in commercial do you do you want to travel the world you know what is it it's so important to know what you want but also what you don't want as well and then craft a way to get that and that's outside of whatever the company is saying these are the career paths because you know what go you can always leave and go do something else (laughs) it's so funny we get stuck in our we can only be in this zone in this area and I'm a specialist here but your career is a great example of showing it doesn't have to be in one place you can still do a do work in STEM but your work in STEM is now as a project manager and not as an engineer so it's still there may not be a career written by the organization that says you can go from here to here because they're different skills but it doesn't mean it's not possible Absolutely. And it, it's those things. I honestly believe we're going to get more and more anomalies where people haven't just followed that linear career path. I believe so, too. And I think if we think about how the world of work is changing, um, whether that's in STEM or outside of STEM, you know, a, different jobs that existed 20 years ago don't exist anymore. And jobs that There'll be jobs in five years' time that we can't even imagine right now, right? We can't we, because the the technology will make things different, and we were like, "Oh, it'll be like the equivalent of people every all, all organizations now have a social media manager." Well, that didn't exist twenty years ago, but there'll be something that comes up that we will have no idea about. We're like, "Oh," and someone's got to go and do those jobs. So it'll be people who've done different jobs before, and the whole I, I believe the idea that you kind of go into one job and you stick at it or you have one specialism, I think that's changing. I think people are a bit more open to that. As long as we don't get a lot of people in leadership roles doing their no, you have to fit nicely into our very strict shaped box. Absolutely. And I I think even I've got this inkling that sometimes people just don't know what to do with me because, and especially now I've got the author aspect to it. I, I had people say to me, Oh, you promote yourself a lot on LinkedIn. And 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 it wasn't meant in a nice in a nice way. And this was a few years ago, this guy said this to me. And just a few weeks ago, he said, Lauren, I'm looking at uh, posting on LinkedIn. Um, do you know how IP works? <laughs> and I was thinking, oh, look who's come around. Yeah. <laughs> Not an early adopter of the Lauren way, but one who's like now looking at you as a role model. So it's interesting, isn't it, about maybe being... I mean, what would I call you? A trailblazer, somebody who's unusual, someone who kind of pushes the edges of the boxes, somebody who takes that. And actually, why can't you be an author and a project manager who's also an engineer? Why not? Like, <laughs> why can't you have multiple hats? And I, uh, different people feel things different ways. I personally find variety to be really joyful and to be able to do different things and learn new things and become different things. I find really, really interesting. And it doesn't mean that you aren't a specialist at what you do. It's just that you can have more than one specialism. Absolutely. I I mean, I remember I had a manager a few years ago now, and he said to me, 
he said, Lauren, you seem really passionate about this is when I was helping out with the women's network. And I was I was a regional lead there for a while, which is great because I got I always say to people, if you get a chance to be part of an employee resource group, do it because it opens up so many doors for networking at many, many different levels. And um, my manager at the time, I don't know. I mean, now I'd probably say he was maybe a little bit jealous because of the circles I was meeting. But he then said to me, well, Lauren, if you know, if you care about people, maybe you should just go into HR. And I, I'm listening to him and I'm thinking, well, I actually think good leaders need good people skills. <laughs> and that could be a leader in any area. <laughs> yeah, it's so interesting because as a person who has worked in HR, that says more about that person's leadership than it does anything about you. <laughs> the idea that only if you can only do people stuff if you work in HR and you probably could be, have a very successful career in HR if that's what you wanted to do but that's really interesting isn't it about how, how people reveal quite a lot about who they are when they challenge and critique other people's way of doing things absolutely I just I've always found that people are desperate to put me in a box and they don't know which box to put me in <laughs> Because you're not in a box. You will not be in a box. You're a, you're not a, a what, not a cube. You could be a dodecahedron or something like that. <laughs> Absolutely. Do, that's the right one. Dodecahedron is the 12-sided 12 12-sided 12 shape, isn't it? It's one of those. It is. Funnily enough, even though I'm an engineer, the reference to me comes from The Simpsons where Lisa was trying to get Maggie to say dodecahedron. <laughs> that's probably where it comes from for me as well. Because I'm like, why is that... Why is that particular shape in my head? I have no idea, but maybe it was from The Simpsons. I love that. But yeah, you can, we don't all have to be nice square QB boxes. We can actually have lots of different facets to us. And I think that's such a good message for anyone out there who is thinking about developing into a new role or a different skill, who is thinking about this organization doesn't value me in the way that I want to be valued. So I actually hello, I can go and step and do something else or do something the same, but somewhere different where you have the type of manager that challenges you and gives you opportunities, not the ones who say, no, please continue doing everything the way we want you to do it. And I think that's a really good um, segue into our quick fire questions. How do you feel about answering some quick fires? Yeah, let's go for it. Right. I know that um, you have your book, but I'd love to know what book are you currently reading? So I'm actually rereading The Seven Habits of Highly Effective People by Stephen R. Covey. I read it when I was at uni and it is an absolutely timeless book. And I still quote it to people. I'm a complete Covey nerd, but I it, it's a great book. Yeah, it's a great book. And I also love a good read of something that you've read before. Sometimes I do things like I read and then I'll listen to it and like kind of do it differently. And I think you always take something new when you reread great stuff like that. And you can't go wrong with the seven habits. It's all good <laughs> stuff. Um, have you got the, the newer version where he's got the eighth habit as well? I don't. I've actually got the existing one that I had all those years ago that I dug out. Because it's, it's also nice to have a, a book that you've read before because it feels read. Oh, yeah. I'm all about the physical hard copy of a book. I love that <laughs> kind of feeling of them. Excellent. For you personally, what is always guaranteed to bring you a bit of work joy? People. I think, I mean, okay, I can see people can also bring the complete opposite, but I, I, I love working with people at different levels, especially when you get the fresh ones coming in, the brand new ideas, and you just see the spark in them. I say when you, when you can see someone and you can see potential and you can see the talent, it just, it lights me up because I think, oh, you're going to be, you're going to have a fantastic career. We just need to make sure we enable that. Yeah. And I think that's an interesting thing, isn't it? About the how do we enable that spark to become something versus forever trying to dampen it down? Yes. And I feel like in your early career, your spark was trying, they were trying to dampen your spark and you're <laughs> trying to like build this up. Love that. Um, what is one bit of advice that you have received in your life that you always find yourself coming back to? So it was something someone said to me at a coffee shop once. And he said to me, there is always more going on than you know. Mm. And I, I, say, I now share this with people and I do come back to it because it's so easy 
to take a situation or take someone something someone has said to you or you know various things and think they don't like me or they're doing it to get at me and it could be absolutely nothing to do with you <laughs> <laughs> and it's it's one of those that now again I'm tuned into it I hear people talk about it and now I can say actually this is what's going on in the background if I happen to have knowledge about it yeah. or if not I say well how do you know this isn't happening or that is happening and they go oh and it's just that looking at things from different perspectives so if you always go along the view of I don't know what's happening and there's something that I am not aware of probably puts you in a good space <laughs> yeah yeah and it's so funny isn't it is we all internalize this idea that if something's like not quite right it must be something to do with us and I think like 99.9 percent .9 of the time it's got nothing to do with us whatsoever Absolutely. but we feel like it has because something doesn't feel right but if you go in with that you could be more curious you could ask more questions you can find out more you can I think have more empathy for other people when maybe they're not being at their best there's so many different things that you can do and I think that's a great piece of advice and I do think that coffee shops are a place where we get really good advice I read it somewhere that they said it's something about hot drinks they said specifically if you put it in both hands that's a time for being open I don't know there's something apparently there's something psychological about it if you've got heat between both hands on a cup or a cup of soup or something like that you are more open to receiving advice and I thought oh that's quite clever <laughs> That's fascinating. I've never heard that before. I was thinking more like coffee and cake, like caffeine and sugar may have helped, <laughs> helped us have a great conversation. But I love that idea that it's actually the the coffee and holding something and being more open to it. Well, all of those things can be true and that could all be good. What is one practical thing that people listening can do today, tomorrow, the next day that you think might help them get a little bit more joy in their working life? advocate for others mm. I'm always gonna um, I either sway between networking like building your networks or advocating for others but I think built advocating is a lot more actionable on the individual yeah. and that can be advocating for someone senior a peer or someone more junior but be that person that speaks up for that person when they are not in the room yeah. it is oh it's so rewarding doing that especially when it works out for the person yeah it's so good and I think as well I call it cheerleading like cheerleading for others um actually helps remind you that you could cheerlead for yourself as well so yes. it helps it like I don't think there is there is there isn't a negative involved with this at all it's like a good thing for them it's a good thing for you and it helps everyone believe in themselves and it helps organizations understand what people are great at as well so amazing stuff Lauren, as we come to the end of our conversation, it's been great. I think we could probably do a few hours and go like, I properly want to know the outfit you wore when you're in the on the undersea, subsea stuff. But maybe we'll get a picture and put that on our socials if you've got any like in your in your gear. It would be amazing. But where can people find out more about you and your work if they are interested in finding out more? So definitely come and find me on LinkedIn. Um, I, I'll share the link uh, so that we've got them. Um, I'm trying to use Instagram more, but LinkedIn is that is my platform of choice. <laughs> so um, absolutely find me there. I am hoping later this year to have valuedatwork.com operational. Right now it's just a landing page. Um, or uh, as we talked about my book, Valued at Work, I'm shining a light on bias to engage, enable and retain women in STEM available from all good bookshops. <laughs> online and in person and what we will do is we'll put all those links in the show notes as well so people can click on straight through and go through them um i also am a link i'm a linkedin person i think it's a good place to be especially in the working world and yeah and go have a little read of the book and if you are in that zone of um maybe you're a man listening and you're thinking i really want to be better at this stuff and i want to understand how to support this it's a great book for you if you are a woman it's a great book for you too but maybe as well encourage um the people around you to think about some of these things and how do we make organizational cultures better for everybody because actually it will be better for everyone if it's better for everyone <laughs> that's how it works <laughs> absolutely Brilliant. Uh, I, and I like it I can just see it now that you you just want these workplaces where people are happy and they want to be at 
work. They get up in the morning and they're excited about it. Yeah. And what a difference that that energy can make um, is it, incredible. So thank you, Lauren, for being a wonderful guest. As I said, we'll pop all those um, links, etc., into the show notes. And thank you very much. Oh, thank you. I've enjoyed it. A huge thank you to Lauren Neal for joining me on the Work Joy Jam podcast today and thinking all about how do we help people feel valued in their work? How do we help create workplace cultures that work for everybody and bring people up and help people through their careers, whether we're just beginning or developing on becoming leaders, etc. I also want to say thank you to Lauren for helping me understand the world of engineering a little bit better. It's not somewhere that I have spent a lot of time working and it was really interesting hearing about things like umbilicals, etc. So I have learned loads today. I think there's things that we can all think about around we can change our specialisms. We can start, as Lauren did, in the engineering world and then become project managers. And it's not that we lose our specialism. We just have different ways of utilising our skills and being experts in different areas we don't just have to pick one thing and stick to it and I think that's a great message for people considering the next step in their careers and how really considering and advocating for others can make a massive difference in their world and in their careers and in their working lives but also for us and how wonderful it can be for us to do those things so many great things to take from Lauren's um, experience and her background and all of her thinking and I would as always encourage you to consider what's one thing that you're going to do do differently consider take on board think about as a result of listening to this podcast Remember, you can stay in touch and hear more via our socials at Create Work Joy. And I'd love to hear from you. If you've got any messages or questions, really happy to reply to them. Uh, I can be uh, emailed at hello at createworkjoy.com. Have a great rest of your day. Mm-hmm.